thank you, thank you for having me. Um, so today, uh, this is this talk is a, a little bit more of a tutorial type talk. I'm going to cover uh, briefly cover a, a, a broad swath of research. Um, hopefully, some of it will be new to you. Um, uh, hopefully, none of it. <laughs> hopefully, you're familiar with at least some of it, though. Um, okay, so. Uh, what are adversarial examples? Adversarial examples are um, these, you know, are things that look like this. We have some input image, say, of a panda, uh, and then we do something, we make some maybe imperceptible modification to that, that panda, um, and our model suddenly gives us an answer that uh, is very surprising to us, even though well, previously it was doing well. Um, in this case, we've turned this panda that convinces the, the model that this panda is in fact a type of monkey. Um, so it, to have a working definition of adversarial examples, um, we'll just define it, define it in this uh, somewhat hand wavy manner as adversarial examples are modified versions of valid inputs that cause a system cha to change from correctly classifying uh, it, uh, the original input to incorrectly classifying the modified input as judged by a human observer. Um, there, there are mathematical uh, definitions of adversarial examples about epsilon balls and uh, things like that, but it, it's pretty hard to put those into practice because um, we don't know what the right uh, space is to, to measure epsilon in. So thinking about it in terms of uh, a human observer makes it pretty clear whether or not we're dealing with adversarial examples. Um, so to come back to the, the simple example I gave, so we have here a valid input and correct behavior out of the model, panda, um, and then we generate, some, and, you know, use some process to generate uh, some perturbation of that input. Uh, this random list image that looks like random noise is actually, you know, we're going to add that uh, to, to the original image, but a much smaller variant of it. Uh, and there's our modified input. It still looks exactly like a panda, but again, the uh, model now is very, very certain that it's a, that it's a monkey. Um, so the, uh, just to make certain that we know what we're talking about, this is we can contrast adversarial examples with a, a few other classes of um, failure modes. Uh, the first is called Foolian examples, where you can, you can learn, you can like evolve these images, these geometric uh, images that um, very, are very confidently predicted to be a particular class. In this case, this, uh, this thing is a, a type of parrot. Uh, the model thinks it's a type of parrot. Or you can just give it a random input that you can also just maximize its, its, um, uh, the probability of that random input uh, on a particular class. Uh, here we have a random in, a image that is classified as bubbles very confidently. Or you could give it a real image, um, but that it, image could be of something that the model has no idea, you know, a real input that the model has no idea how to uh, deal with. Uh, in this case, this picture of rocks, um, the model thinks that it might be baseballs, uh, it might be a baseball because it doesn't know anything about uh, classifying rocks. Um, so these are not adversarial examples uh, because we didn't start with uh, an image that, uh, that the model knew how to handle and then turn it into a model that the, it, it turn it into an image that the model failed to handle. Um, okay, so, so how do we actually make these? The, the original idea uh, for uh, generating adversarial examples was let's just do optimization directly on the input with respect to the model. Um, so in other words, we're going to compute the gradient of some desired output class with respect to that input uh, and then adjust the input itself, the pixels of the image, by that gradient uh, and then see if that new image produces the desired output. Um, if it doesn't, we'll assume that it's a step in the right direction we'll, uh, and we'll just repeat that process from from the modified image. And eventually we'll end up with uh, an image. We're guaranteed, you know, if we do that long enough and we have a, a, a proper optimizer, we're guaranteed to end up with an image that will be, uh, you know, classified uh, by the, the de desire, classified into the desired output. Uh, the only question is like, how much did we have to change the image? And it turns out, as, as I think we all know, you don't have to, it, uh, it doesn't have to change the image very much in order to give a confident prediction of the desired target. Um, so this, this attack, this uh, optimization-based attack, is, is very powerful, but it's also slow. Um, it may take many, t uh, many steps to converge to a particular output, given a particular input. 
Um, and you, you have to be careful uh, to correctly constrain the, the output. Um, and the, the, that those additional constraints uh, can make this substantially slower than just running a normal optimizer. So um, the, the optimization based attack is slow, but uh, maybe we can make it faster uh, if we just assume that, these, uh, that the models that we're learning are basically linear models. And then we'll, we can just take a single uh, fixed step size, fixed length step size along the gradient um, to assume that that's going to like generally actually cross a decision boundary. Uh, and so this is the core idea behind uh, what's called the fast gradient sign method, um, which I'll, I'll look at uh, briefly in a bit more detail here. Um, so uh, for fast gradient sign, we're going to try to maximize the loss uh, on a particular uh, adversarial example. So j here is the loss function, and uh, x tilde is the uh, adversarial example, theta are the model param parameters. So we can approximize uh, that loss function, uh, again, with this linearity assumption, uh, as uh, being a linear combination of the loss on the, the original input, x, um, plus the difference of the, the uh, original input and the, and the perturbed input uh, times the gradient of the loss uh, uh, with respect to the original input. Um, and then additionally, we need to somehow satisfy this constraint that, they're, that they be close to each other. Uh, so this is a max norm constraint uh, for fast gradient sign, which means that like uh, every, uh, in the case of an image, every pixel should uh, be no larger, uh, it should be no further from the original uh, pixel than epsilon. Um, and it turns out with a little bit of manipulation, we can turn that uh, max norm constraint and linearity uh, assumption into the single epsilon times the sine of the gradient uh, thing, which gives us a really nice, easy to evaluate closed form solution for generating potential adversarial examples. Um, so fast gradient sign is fast. Um, it only requires a single forward and backward pa uh, pass through the, uh, the target network. Um, it's a, it's a white box attack, so you do have to have the network of parameters to, to run fa fast gradient sign, as I've described it. Um, and it's also very effective on undefended models. So you, uh, the original fast gradient sign uh, work showed that it could get, uh, um, be, it generate successful attacks over 90% of the time on state-of-the-art uh, ImageNet classifiers. Um, and the, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice, uh, FGS is very nice because it's actually very easy to uh, extend it for, to um, targeted attacks. Um, so in normal fast gradient sign, we add the gradient uh, with respect, we move on the gradient with respect to the, the true uh, class of the original input, but we can uh, instead target a particular class and just uh, move in the opposite direction towards, along the gradient towards the target class. Um, it can also be extended to a very simple iterated attack um, where you just run your preferred variant of fast gradient sign um, for a fixed number of steps, uh, for example, just five steps uh, with a smaller perturbation size at each step um, and accumulate those perturbations along the way. Um, and so iterated attacks are, are much more powerful actually than fast gradient sign while only being a constant factor uh, slower, um, which means that they're faster than the original optimization attack that I described to you. Um, so coming back then to optimization attacks, uh, again, the opti running an optimizer directly on the input is extremely effective, but it's uh, also very slow because of the, the constraints. So maybe we can actually deal with these constraints, uh, get rid of these constraints by being a little bit more clever with, uh, with the math. Um, and uh, if we can do that, then we should be able to use full powered op optimization attacks uh, rather than uh, fast gradient sign or, or attacks that are limited to a fixed number of iterations. Um, and if we can do this, uh, then uh, actually because optimizers are so much more powerful than these, these simple linear approximations that fast gradient sign gives, um, we can find actually much uh, smaller uh, perturbations to the inputs than uh, fast gradient sign finds. Um, and we can basically be successful. All, uh, we can be always successful. Our attack can always succeed. 
Um, so how do we do this? It, it turns out that the, the core observation is that there, all we need is a simple change of, uh, change of variable. Um, it, this, uh, this formula looks a little bit different from the previous formulas, but it's really the same. This 10h of w is actually just the changing, uh, sending in for the, the perturbation, um, uh, x, uh, the, the difference between x tilde, the adversarial example, and x. Um, and so uh, it, by changing the variable, the, this, we're, we're just saying that um, this change variable 10h forces it be, to be between zero, uh, negative one and one, and then we can do whatever uh, manipulation we need to to rescale and, and uh, scale and translate our um, our perturbation to uh, to be in the correct range for the particular problem. In other words, between zero and two fifty five for images. Um, and doing this, you know, optimizer is still going to be slower than a fixed number of, of um, uh, FGS steps, but it can be um, it can still be sufficiently fast to do. Um, basically, whatever we want. If we if we feel like we have enough time to run it, um, we can on uh, CFAR ten um, generate adversarial examples for every target class from any input image, uh, and have those uh, those examples be indistinguishable to the human eye. Um, okay, so changing uh, changing focus to a very different approach here. What if instead of doing these mechanical-based uh, attacks like fast gradient sign or running an optimizer um, where we uh, just do some math to figure out where the likely adversarial examples are, what if we tried to learn how to generate these things? Um, so the idea here is to actually train a separate network to transform a given input into an adversarial example for some particular target network. So again, the, uh, talking about probably a white, bo white box of taxes here. Uh, and so this is, this is work that I, I did with a collaborator at Google. Um, and um, the, the basic idea is we're, we're going to have this, um, this ATN that we're training, uh, which is this function G. Um, and it's uh, going to attack, a, uh, sorry, a, the, the loss uh, for this ATN is going to be divided in two parts. The input space loss, which is just uh, our normal L2 loss uh, or whatever you want. Um, to say that the output of the, uh, of the adversarial transformation network should be similar to the input, um, just like in fast gradient sign, having the L infinity loss. Um, and then the target network F uh, is F in this, in this notation. And the important uh, uh, part of the loss for the ATNs is that uh, we have this output space loss. So um, our target network outputs some probability distribution across classes. Um, and we want to have the, uh, the input generated, uh, the output of the uh, adversarial transformation network when it's passed to that uh, target network to generate almost exactly the same uh, probability distribution, but uh, we're going to re-rank um, the, uh, um, the most probable output uh, swap, basically swap the most probable output with our target output. So during training, we're going to say that, you know, if the most probable output was cat, but we're targeting uh, teapot, uh, we're going to swap um, the cat and teapot, uh, basically columns in our, in our output probability vector uh, and use that as the, as the um, training target. Um, and uh, so you can do, you can do this uh, in a couple of different ways. There's uh, what we call perturbation ATNs, which will just learn to directly generate the perturbation uh, for a given input um, that will cause it to be misclassified as a particular target class. Or we can um, do what are called adversarial autoencoding ATNs, which will learn to generate the entire adversarial example, uh, uh, to regenerate the entire adversarial example from a given input, just like an autoencoder. But now the autoencoded output is actually adversarial. Um, so PATNs um, produce adversarial examples that are very similar to the original input. input. Uh, as you can see in this, this image, uh, this dog uh, image, there is not, you know, it looks exactly like a dog. It has all the, the detail. Um, I think you can see there that, you know, you can see the detail of the fur. Um, but it has this um, kind of ghost thing in the lower left-hand corner uh, that actually looks like maybe it's inspired by part of a soccer ball. And that is, in fact, uh, a, an ATN example that's targeting uh, the soccer ball class. 
Um, similarly, the same image uh, targeting zebra, you, you know, there's really, uh, as a human, I, I can't even tell that that's, um, that that's modified, but there's a little bit of modification in the lower left-hand corner there that convinces the, the target network that this is a zebra. Um, for the autoencoding uh, variants of ATN, though, um, we produce a much more diverse uh, collection of adversarial examples, and they're, they're much more effective, but the perturbations are, are more noticeable. Um, they also happen to be easier and faster to, to train and faster to evaluate than PATN. So they have a lot of advantages, but the cost is that um, you can, you know, the, the, the delta between the two images, the original input and the, the um, uh, adversarial uh, example is, is larger. Here we're, again, targeting the zebra class. I think that we'd all agree that that's still an image of a dog. It just looks a little bit furrier for some reason. Um, uh, and it is, it's a successful example. Um, and here we're targeting a, the volcano class. And I think that this, the, this is probably my, one of my favorite ones because uh, in order to convince the, the target model that this was a volcano, it just added orange dots um, to the face of the dog. Um, so the kind of the key observation here, I think, is that uh, with, with adversarial transformation networks, we can actually learn um, uh, semantic weaknesses in the models, right? So like here, we, we've learned that this, this is uh, attacking actually Inception ResNet v2, a state-of-the-art model at the time um, earlier this year. Um, and uh, Inception ResNet v2 thinks that if you have a bunch of orange dots in the image, that it's a volcano. Uh, so, like, it's focusing in on something, you know, presumably on lava flows and uh, whatever, and that's a very high probability of volcano. Uh, and that's clearly not, you know, that doesn't match with the human intuition. So this is, uh, as opposed to kind of the mechanical way of uh, generating these things where we just get these noise images. Um, with adversarial transformation networks, we can end up seeing something, uh, learning something semantic about uh, where our models fail. Um, so yeah, so looking at some, some actual results here, these are three of the, three of the different um, architectures we looked at for uh, doing autoencoding uh, adversarial transformation networks. Um, and this, is, this table shows the, the attack success rate and, uh, across four different target classes. Um, so we were able to successfully attack um, uh, Inception ResNet v2 with our, with our best model around 90% of the time. Um, fast gradient sign, the, which is untargeted, so it's actually a much easier problem. It just has to cross some decision boundary rather than a particular decision boundary. Um, the, its success rate on the same set of validation images was only 48%. Um, so this will, this will be a recurrent theme uh, in my talk. Uh, fast gradient sign, it was, you know, it's a very, uh, very useful attack, but it's a very weak attack at this point. Um, the models, our models have gotten much more robust to fast gradient sign, but that doesn't mean that they're robust to adversary, uh, adversarial examples in general. Um, in, this, in the case of the dog image, the, the attack failed, which is why it's outlined in green, um, and it's a very noticeable perturbation as well. This was a very, uh, you know, a very strong uh, fast gradient sign attempt uh, that, only, that only succeeds about half the time. So, um, Another, another nice feature of uh, adversarial transformation networks is that once they're trained, uh, it, they only require a single forward pass to generate an adversarial example uh, from a given input. Um, so in terms of like actual attack speed, uh, our, our best, our most effective model um, could generate a, a adversarial examples in 0.16 seconds, uh, and the other two are around, around 0.5 seconds. Um, in comparison, fast gradient sign, which requires both a forward and a backward pass through the target model, uh, takes about 0.58 seconds. Um, so uh, substantially slower than our, than our most, uh, most effective model and fastest model. Um, and in terms of training speed, though, of course, like this is, this is where the additional cost comes in. You have to, you have to train uh, your ATN if you want to generate attacks. So how long does it actually take to train? Uh, tr when we were training against uh, ImageNet, uh, on a single J a GPU, we were, we were able to train uh, adversarial transformation networks in about two hours. 
um, we actually only needed 0.1 epochs of, of, of ImageNet um, to, to train uh, the ATN. Uh, so they actually, they train very fast. In, in comparison, to train uh, a, an ImageNet model to completion takes about 100 epochs. So it's 1,000 times longer to, take, uh, to train um, ImageNet itself, which means that, in theory, you could um, train many, of, many ATNs in the process of uh, uh, to, uh, training your actual target network if you're doing adversarial training. Um, okay, so other model types. So we, we've uh, been, you know, I've been talking only about classifiers so far, but it turns out you can also attack generative models. Um, so how, how can we create adversarial examples that, um, that might impact generative models? If we focus on latent space uh, generative models, uh, which a uh, generative model it is a model that takes an input uh, uh, and it learns to generate a new output based on that input, um, roughly speaking. And, and so then a latent space generative model is, uh, is a model that's going to learn a, a latent rep an internal representation of the data uh, in order to produce the output, uh, uh, in order to generate its output. But it, again, we're, we're a generative model in the case of images, of course, is going to produce more images rather than uh, classifications of images. Um, so what's this look like kind of in graphical format? Uh, we have some adversarial input X that we pass into our, uh, in, into our encoder. Um, our encoder uh, encodes X to our latent space C. Uh, and then the decoder, the, which is the actual generative part of the model, um, generates a, a new output uh, X hat. Um, and so this whole, whole model is our latent, our latent generative model. In this case, it was a VAE GAN. Um, and optionally, we could um, uh, have an attacker trained uh, classifier uh, that just learns to classify our latent vector Z um, in order to leverage uh, attacks like FGS. Um, but we don't need to do that in order to, to attack. And in fact, that's, that's less effective. Um, so what's this actually look like? On the left, we have our original inputs. Um, and then on the right, we have our, our reconstructions, our, the, um, which uh, look pretty similar. Um, but if we just uh, uh, target a particular um, output, a particular desired output through the latent vector, that, uh, um, through the latent space, uh, we can cause all of those same inputs with very minor modifications, as you can see on the left-hand side. Uh, uh, to look like this um, same woman with black hair. Um, so generative models, uh, a lot of people felt like generative models were, would be the thing that uh, save us from adversarial examples. This, um, this, this work that we did does uh, not seem to support that uh, hypothesis. Okay, so other types of attacks. Uh, everything that I've talked about so far are black, are, are, were white box attacks. Um, or were designed for white box attacks. But you can also do black box attacks. There's a couple of ways to do it, and I'll just talk about one here. Um, so you can train your own model on a, on a relevant data set and then generate adversarial examples against that model using your favorite adversarial example generation techniques, and then send those examples to attack the, the target model. Um, so uh, this is called a transfer attack, but it, to, be, to be clear, so basically, all you need to do to do a black box attack uh, in machine learning is have a data set like ImageNet, train your image classifier using that data set, and then attack your own model. And you can send those, you can send the output of those attacks to uh, whoever, you're, you know, whoever you're trying to attack, um, and uh, it will probably work. Um, in fact, it, it, yeah, it works quite well. Um, even if you don't know the exact data set the model was trained on or the architecture of the target model. Um, so, great, so like that, that's kind of uh, disconcerting if you want these things to work well. Um, but uh, let's see, what, what if we you know, look at different machine learning algorithms instead of just paying attention to deep networks? Um, can we generate adversarial examples uh, against linear networks or, or uh, logistic regression or uh, decision trees, things like that. Um, and a, a lot of the kind of press around adversarial examples over the past few years has, has painted this picture that really this is a problem. Adversarial examples are a unique problem for deep networks. 
Um, but actually, uh, deep networks are the most robust, tractable machine learning models that we, that we currently know of. Um, everything else is much more vulnerable to, uh, to adversarial examples. Um, and this, this work uh, showed this very nicely. Uh, the left column is um, the is uh, the rate of successful attack against a particular uh, trained deep network uh, on um, adversarial examples generated by non-deep network uh, uh, machine learning models. Um, and so you can see, uh, basically, so it's hard to parse this entire table all at once, but the, the core idea is that if, it's, if the box is uh, lighter colored, then the attack was less successful, and if it's darker colored, the attack was more successful. Um, so in comparison, we can see that uh, kind of the, the right-hand side of the table, everything but the first column is, is very dark. Um, every, every other uh, model type um, is more vulnerable to these examples, whether they're generated by deep, deep networks or by linear models of various sorts. They're, they're all more vulnerable to adversarial examples than deep networks are. Okay, so that was the attack side. Um, how can we like hope to defend against this stuff. Um, we might try to do things to improve the models. Maybe we can um, try to make the models more robust to attack. Um, we could try detecting the attacks, um, or we could try to make cal calibrated predictions, which is to say that like, maybe the model will be fooled, but at least it will know that it shouldn't be confident. Um, we could try to improve the algorithms um, by maybe, maybe we can make better optimizers somehow. In, to, uh, uh, to learn, you know, to train better, better models that are, that are more robust somehow, or maybe there's just some better training procedure that we could do, um, and we could try to improve the data. Uh, maybe if we just had really large labeled data sets, maybe that would be sufficient to learn the true generalities, uh, the true regularities in the data, um, and we wouldn't be as vulnerable. Or maybe there's some way to um, leverage unlabeled data uh, because it's often the case that, uh, you know, particularly for images, we have essentially unlimited, Im infinite images that we could train on if we didn't have to have labels. Uh, or maybe, uh, as, as somebody was asking about earlier, maybe synthetic data sets um, could be, if we had a really uh, realistic synthetic face data, data set, for instance, um, maybe that would help us uh, learn more robust models um, because we wouldn't have these, uh, these limits on, on training data. Or maybe there's you know, some other thing out of left field that, uh, that we can't predict yet. Um, so I'll look at a, look at a few of the um, defenses that, that, that have been proposed in the literature. Uh, going back to the question that was asked earlier, uh, uh, this was work that, that I, I did with uh, some colleagues at Google, uh, looking at the information bottleneck. Um, and uh, so like maybe we can apply information theory to classification. Uh, and <laughs> the gentleman asked the question so well, he's basically reading my slide. So what is the information bottleneck? Uh, uh, given some input distribution X that is mapped to some latent space C and then classified as Y, uh, we want to maximize the mutual information between Z and Y while also minimizing the mutual information between X and Z. So again, with this encoder decoder model, if we have an input X and a latent space Z, the mutual information between X and Z should be minimal, and the mutual information between Z and Y should be maximal. So in intuitively, this just means that we want to forget everything that's irrelevant about X for correctly classifying Y, while remembering everything else that is relevant about X for classifying Y in our latent uh, representation Z. Um, and the, the hypothesis is that if we can, uh, if we can like, make our networks do this, this you know, um, kind of task uh, relevant forgetting, then uh, maybe those networks will be more robust to adversarial examples uh, because the, the network should actually be ignoring a lot of features of the input space um, that are, that are irre irrelevant for the classification test. Um, so what's this look like? We, we trained, um, here we have an inception V2 model uh, that uh, you know, state-of-the-art at the time for, for ImageNet, and so here are some original inputs, um, and there are correct classifications. These are, these are test samples that were all correctly classified. 
and then on that unmodified, you know, standard ImageNet v2 model, we generated some adversarial examples using the um, the, the fast optimization-based attack that I that I mentioned before. That optimization-based attack that that is um, basically can be successful 100% of the time against uh, normal models, um, and in the case of Inception v2, it was uh, successful 100% of the time. Uh, so all of these uh, all these images have a little red label indicating that they're successful t targeted attack, um, and the the black swath on the right hand side of this is actually these are this is showing the the perturbations that the uh, optimization based attack generated. Um, so you can see that they're extremely small. Uh, if we take that Inception ResNet, uh, sorry, if we take that Inception v2 model and just remove the top layer, the top logistic regression, and replace it with a, uh, an information bottleneck logistic regression, then when we attack that with, again, the same optimization-based attack, uh, we, we get this result. On the left-hand side, again, this is the, the actual uh, adversarial examples, attempted adversarial examples, and you can see these perturbations are, are much, much larger compared to uh, the, the, the non-VIB based method. Um, and additionally, the, all the images with purple crosses through them are failed attacks. Um, so the, this, you know, the, the most powerful attack that we know how to, how to use, right, that, that, that we know of right now, that, like in principle, like basically the most powerful attack that there could be, the optimization based attack, that is 100% successfully normally. Is successful normally uh, failed actually 50% of the time um, against uh, the information bottleneck uh, model. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So there, there's there's some hope that maybe um, maybe we can be more robust to adversarial examples. Um, another uh, really nice idea is this idea of adversarial training. Um, while we while we train a particular model. We can just show it adversarial examples, and we know what the true label should be because we generated the adversarial example. So let's just um, lay, you know, uh, train the model on those uh, examples with the with the correct label, and maybe the model will learn to be robust to those um, robust to those adversarial examples. Um, now, in this case, the the adversary really does need to be fast for this to be useful. So we couldn't hope to run the optimization-based attack on this because that's, that's still many times slower than uh, something like fast gradient sign. Uh, and fast gradient sign was the first attack that made this really uh, practical. Um, and it does turn out that this can substantially improve the robustness of a network against the, the adversary that was used during training. Um, so here, here's a very thorough study that was done. Um, without adversarial training, uh, using a fast gradient sign-based attack, um, the, the attack was successful, you know, 50 to 60% of the time, around 60% of the time, uh, or sorry, successful around 40% of the time. Uh, with adversarial training, it, the success rate of the attack dropped to about 10% of the time. Um, but again, this is uh, just on fast gradient sign based uh, uh, adversarial examples. Um, so unfortunately, training with fast gradient sign doesn't confer robustness uh, against even the simple iterative attack. Um, uh, and so here we, this is the uh, accuracy on, um, uh, on fa uh, sorry, on iterated, uh, the iterated fast gradient sign method. Um, without adversarial training, we see it's like the accuracy is around 20%, 10 or 20%. Um, and with adversarial training, it, we only add a couple of percentage points to the accuracy. So it, it really didn't, uh, give us any robustness. Training on fast gradient sign did not give us any real robustness to iterated uh, fast gradient sign. Um, and I, I think that this is, you know, kind of the, again, the general, the general point here is that, like, there really is a, a spectrum of power and attacks. Um, so if you're looking at defenses with, that are based, uh, you know, that work well on fast gradient sign, uh, you should probably look at some other attacks as well. So instead of just uh, training with um, uh, fast gradient side, uh, uh, doing adversarial training with fast gradient sign, maybe we can do it with iterated attacks. They're not too slow. Um, and this, this can be, be viewed in, uh, interestingly in a manner similar to like uh, GAN's generative adversarial examples as, as a search for a saddle point. 
uh, where we're trying to uh, estimate the strongest adversary for the network with this row of theta function um, by looking at the loss uh, uh, for the network on particular adversarial, uh, adversarial examples. And we're going to, we're going to, we want to, this is a mini max problem, so we're going to uh, try to minimize that and maximize this. Um, so, yeah, if we look at fast gradient sign and iterative adversarial examples together, um, the uh, accuracy is very poor on both of them without adversarial training. If we just train on, F, uh, on fast gradient sign, the accuracy on fast gradient sign examples gets very high, but uh, iterated attack is uh, uh, completely hopeless. But if we train on uh, the iterated attack only, then we get reasonable reasonable robustness to both. It's still actually pretty bad, but it's, it's okay. Um, so uh, another variant of adversarial training is called virtual adversarial training. Um, and the idea here is that instead of um, using labeled data uh, and generating adversarial examples from the labeled data, let's just take unlabeled data and uh, generate adversarial examples, untargeted adversarial examples uh, on that unlabeled data and uh, constrain the model uh, to produce similar, uh, to generate similar, similar outputs, similar classification probabilities uh, for both the original unmodified, uh, adver uh, unmodified unlabeled input and the adversarial unlabeled input. Um, so this is, this is a pretty cool trick uh, because now we have unlimited, uh, unlimited you know, images that we can put in and just say that uh, even though we generated an adversarial example from it, it should still give us um, the same, approximately the same classification uh, distribution as the uh, unmodified image. Um, so we get access to a, a lot more training data. Um, unfortunately, this, uh, the, the work that introduced this did not, to study, uh, did not study its impact on something like ImageNet. I'm not aware of, of follow-up research that's looked at this yet. It's, it's pretty recent. Well, it's not that recent. So, uh, seems like a great idea, but we don't actually know if it works in, in the real world. They only tried it on toy problem. Um, much more recently, uh, there's a, another pretty interesting idea called mix-up networks um, from, uh, from the team at Facebook. Uh, and the idea here is that we're going to generate new training data by taking pairs of um, training examples uh, and interpolating between them in input space and in label space. So if we have a picture of a cat and a teapot, uh, we can like just uh, do a linear, uh, you know, blend, an alpha blend of those two images. So it's a, a, a cat on, it's superimposed on a teapot and say that the true label for this image uh, should be, you know, so if it was like a 60-40 blend, uh, then the true label should be 60% cat and 40% teapot. Um, so it's a cute idea. Uh, and um, and it's, it fundamentally encourages the network to learn this, this kind of the smooth confidence funct function between pairs of classes. Um, and it, it basically exponentially increases the, the amount of training data we have. Um, so the smoother confidence uh, function gives, a, gives a, a benefit, a noticeable benefit against black box attacks. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't help that much against, uh, against non-fast gradient sign white box attacks. Um, this is what the numbers look like, and you can see that um, the iterated fast gradient sign, the, the rightmost column, uh, the attack basically always succeeds um, uh, for white box attacks. But on the black box side, it's, uh, you know, it does much better. Um, so a lot of defenses have been tried. Uh, defensive distillation uh, was a you know, very nice idea uh, a few years ago, but it was broken um, last year. Uh, there have been a lot of attempts to detect adversarial examples. Um, the same researchers uh, at Berkeley uh, showed, you know, for a set of 10 of these, these things that they were all vulnerable. They're, they're very easy to defeat. Um, there have been a lot of other published and, and unpublished approaches that people have tried. You can try adding noise to, the, to your input before classifying it. You can try to blur your input before classifying it. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you could try to do things, clever things with generative models. None of these things uh, seem to actually uh, work uh, in the variants that have been tried so far. Um, but maybe there's hope. Um, there's, uh, over the summer, some researchers uh, 
had this idea that like maybe adversarial examples themselves are not robust. They seem to often rely on pretty high frequency noise uh, in the inputs. Um, so maybe like actually if we just move the camera around, those examples are no longer going to be um, adversarial. And so like we shouldn't care about this problem actually. Like if, you, if the only problem you care about is self-driving cars, then like certainly that's the world, world you live in, the camera is moving. You know, you're not going to see a, just a single image of a stop sign, and, um, and that's how you have to decide whether or not to stop. You'll get to look at that stop sign from lots of different angles over a number of seconds, and you know, maybe some of those will be correct, even if somebody's like, tried to confuse you. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a reasonable hypothesis to, to, to test. Uh, and, in, and in fact, it's true that like, uh, under kind of normal camera uh, transformations, um, fast gradient sign, adversarial examples are, are not robust. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't save us. Uh, five days later, OpenAI published on their blog uh, a demonstration that, uh, of, of a pretty simple modification to adversarial example generation that are robust to camera transformations. Uh, and then uh, a few days after that, uh, Don Song's group um, published a, a really nice paper showing that you could uh, generate robust adversarial perturbations and print them out as stickers and j literally they just stick them to stop signs. Uh, um, and they, those were robust to, uh, were quite robust to camera transformations as well. So, um, the, yeah, so we're, we're not out of the woods yet. <laughs> so why do these things matter? So yeah, we can attack self-driving vehicles. Um, we, we've seen uh, real attacks on commercial Im image classification. Uh, we've also seen attacks on malware classification, which is so stepping outside of the image domain where a lot of this research is focused. There, are, there is actually good research showing that this is a real security problem for other types of classifiers, not just image classifiers. Um, and as we deploy machine learning systems uh, kind of in everything as, as we're doing, uh, these, these attacks are almost certainly going to be used to cause real harm. Um, and it's really clear that the, the attackers have the, the advantage right now. Um, optimization is just an extremely powerful tool. Uh, and it, so that we can even do these black box, black, black box attacks that get to leverage uh, optimization, um, both by uh, these offline transfer attacks and also online attacks that don't even require gradients. Um, and if you can, you know, if you're, in a, if you're an attacker in a situation where you can do white box attacks, you're really only constrained by, by your creativity and access to, to compute power. Uh, so we really do need new defenses. Um, we just talked about a number of defenses. So, so how did these stack up on, uh, how are we stacking up on like these uh, proposed ways of improving, uh, um, uh, of defending against adversarial examples? Making models that are more, more robust, we have you know, some indication that our adversarial training or this information bottleneck uh, stuff or maybe these mix-up networks uh, can make models that are more robust. Detection, we don't, uh, t I'm not aware of any research that, that uh, convincingly shows that any detection me method actually works, so I, I don't think that there's anything, um, you know, that's an open field if you have a brilliant detection idea, uh, excellent. Um, calibrated, uh, calibrated predictions, uh, also there, there's not much research there, but what there has been um, that I'm aware of is, uh, does, is, not, is not robust to adversarial uh, attacks. Um, if we tried to, in terms of improving the algorithms, uh, there's no security oriented research for making better optimizers. Um, and there's, uh, in terms of better training procedures, we, we saw adversarial training and, and mix up. These are both nice training procedures that give us something. I think that there's probably uh, more opportunity to find things to do there. Um, in terms of uh, collecting larger data sets, nobody's studied whether, like, um, that I'm aware of, uh, whether you know, doubling the size or, or making, having 10x more labeled data, does that uh, make you noticeably more robust adversarial examples? That's an open question, I think. Um, in terms of leveraging unlabeled data, this virtual adversarial training uh, seems very promising. Um, but uh, it needs to, needs to be proven in a, uh, on a real problem. Um, and I'm not aware of any research on using synthetic data sets yet. Uh, and maybe there's something that we're missing. So 
the conclusion uh, that I have is that it, the field of machine learning really needs a, a better security or a more security oriented mindset. Um, it's, it's too easy to forget, forget uh, Schneier's law, which is that anyone can invent a security system that they themselves cannot break. Um, so let's, let's try to keep that in mind as we're doing uh, research at the intersection of security and machine learning. Um, and uh, just to leave you with one very concrete suggestion, if you're, if you're looking at defending against adversarial examples, um, I would urge you to not just look at performance on fast gradient sign. Uh, I've said this a number of times, but fast gradient sign is a much too weak attack to be interesting. Uh, I, I personally believe that the gold standard attack um, uh, for any defense that's being considered is the optimization attack. Um, it's simple to implement and it's reasonably fast. So if you're, you know, if you think that you have a really great idea about defenses, compare it to that optimization attack if at all possible. But at least compare it to the iterated fast gradient side, the iterated methods, um, or uh, some of the other interesting attacks like deep pool and universal adversarial perturbations. The, there's, you know, fast gradient sign is a nice starting point, but uh, as, a, as a community, we really need to make certain that we're, we're being uh, uh, honest with ourselves when we, when we consider defenses. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Any questions for Ian? What's your understanding of the state of the art and the whyness of the existence of these adversarial perturbations? Because you know the narrative about the whole uh, small additions adding up with the linear effect. So that narrative was actually recently challenged by uh, this work, which showcased the, uh, the prevalence of single pixel attacks, mm. where you just change one pixel, and that basically kind of systematically, at least in my opinion, dismantles the whole linear narrative, right? So, uh, do you have any intuition as to? Like at least the state of the art in the uh, basically explaining the or at least exploring the whyness of these uh, perturbations. Um, it, I mean, so so it's an interesting perspective. Like I I, I haven't looked in detail at the single pixel attacks. Um, I, you know, I'm aware of it, but uh, the to the extent that I've thought about it, I didn't come to that same conclusion. So maybe that you know that's something that we could. Um, I like to me. It, I mean, the, these spaces are very high dimensional, and and uh, uh, it isn't all that surprising to me that like, we can actually find single pixel, single pixel attacks that find some decision boundary in the high dimensional, high dimensional space, uh, even though the models are mostly linear. Right. Um, I, I, my, you know, this, um, I, I think that the, linear, you know, the, the linearity theory of these models is the best, we, we, the best I've seen. I mean, it's, it's almost obviously true for, for the case of ReLU networks. Right. Um, and in fact, I, I mean, in a, in a very real sense, it's, it's definitely true for ReLU networks because um, it, you can view any ReLU network as a, um, a ReLU network is basically a, uh, a dictionary of linear networks where the, the um, parts of the network that are zero get, get turned off, right? Those, those just disappear and everything else is linear. So you basically what you, what you have with a ReLU network is just a bunch of linear networks. And so definitely everything is linear except for that last softmax, right? Um, so I, I, I mean, I think that these things are, are linear. Um, it's just such a high dimensional space. Like we, we don't really have a good, we're not good at modeling these things in our own head. We don't have great intuitions for it. Uh, at least I don't. Um, so I, but I, I think it is still linear even though we can find single pixel attacks. Okay. Uh, the related question that I had was, uh, I think you mentioned uh, this very good point about the epsilon ball, right? Uh, to me, uh, you know, the constraint itself, uh, the, one of the issues that I've had is that it does not kind of capture the semantics. Right. So uh, in the sense that, assume that uh, I, I basically use this style transfer method to generate adversarial attacks. So if you have a cat, and then if you have a, a pattern, and then uh, you know, there's this very nice work by uh, the Magenta team at Google Research, mm -hmm. which basically does nice style transfer between a, a format and the picture, picture right? So when you basically uh, uh, you know, take alpha times the picture and then mi one minus alpha times the pattern and then you go all the way on the line, mm -hmm. then you see that you basically have these phase transition points. At some alpha, the uh, network goes away from cat and dramatically predicts something like oil filter or something like that. So, but then if you look at that image, right, 
uh, that image is a very far away in terms of like the epsilon distance. But semantically, if you show it to any person, he w he or she would guess right. it it is cat. So, what what do you think is the uh, like the best way of incorporating this uh, semantic distance? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so um, I, I think that the the epsilon ball. Uh, kind of uh, mathematical approach to trying to define uh, adversarial examples is is not in input space, but that's really the space that, of course, we end up looking at things in, right? So we measure things in L1 or L2 or L infinity distance, um, and we think of that epsilon ball, but that's not really the epsilon ball that the, they're talking about. They're, you know, people really want it to be about some perceptual, you know, like the epsilon ball on the image manifold type thing, right? right. Um, uh, and the, the problem for, for me with the epsilon ball uh, definition of adversarial examples is that we don't have that metric. We don't have that perceptual metric. And basically, if we did have it, it there's, you know, it's not unreasonable to believe that like we would at that point have actually solved the adversarial example problem, right? right? Because like if we've moved um, outside of the epsilon ball or you know, if we've moved within the epsilon ball uh, in the perceptual space, then it's uh, still a teapot right. to a human. Or, or it's, you know, if we've moved outside of it, then it's turned from a teapot into a cat to a human. Uh, yeah. And so we wouldn't say that it's adversarial an adversarial example. Right. So you know, I, yeah, at this point, I still prefer the hand wavy thing because epsilon ball, whatever space you're in, it, it, uh, I, it seems a little bit problematic. It's uh, yeah. hard for me to know how to use that. But I, I do know that when I look at something, it may or may not be adversarial. Hi, uh, hey. Ian, fantastic uh, talk, brings us up to speed on, on this entire area. Um, my question is, you know, a lot of the definitions that we saw here were basically a human looks at it and says, nah, too much change, right? Right. Um, have you seen work that's kind of looking at, at a domain where you don't have to have a human analyze how much adversarial perturbation it is? And what would be sort of a direction to think about in that space? Yeah, I mean, so this uh, relates to the previous uh, question, uh, you know, again, this epsilon ball idea. Um, the, there, there is a lot of research, not in the adversarial example domain, but just in kind of uh, machine, you know, computer vision area uh, around um, trying to define um, perceptual, uh, perceptual losses, like uh, SS, uh, SSIM, um, the structured similarity uh, metric. Um, is an, an example of that. It you know, tries to incorporate the idea that you know, pixels near each other are structurally related to each other and this hierarchical thing. But it still, it still doesn't exactly line up to what humans do, so it's not perfectly perceptual. Um, and so the hunt goes on for perfectly perceptual things. Um, I, I personally uh, have a strong bias right now towards information theory, actually. Um, I think that, that might, there, there might be some uh, kind of very principled um, ways of defining this problem that, uh, from an information theoretic standpoint that also seem to co correspond with like that, er that early research we did with the information bottleneck. Okay. 